Uh, customers will buy what they what they build or engage in what they build and in the event that there's no product market but customers won't and ultimately the free market will decide yeah, there, true, true. One, like one, if we're having we're having a, if yeah, go ahead there's one uh, i think you're both right and there's one sort of hook which explains why so simon a few moments ago was saying you know he would love to be able to borrow against his bitcoin without having to go to, you know, a Celsius or some other trusted party. And so I, I work on a protocol called Sovereign and about $500 million have been borrowed against Bitcoin by people who are using the protocol to be able to do exactly that without a trusted third party. But there's one major problem. And that major problem is that in order to do that, they have to use a peg, a Bitcoin peg. And this Bitcoin peg is not 100% trusted. It's far better than a Celsius or a Coinbase or a Binance, but it's not as cryptographically trustless as it could be. And this is the crux of the debate, right? Do we need to introduce a change, and many people call this the last change that Bitcoin will ever need, to allow Bitcoin to be used permissionlessly by other decentralized protocols built on Bitcoin? Right. And there's there. And, and I think here, Ethereum, you asked, like, what what can we learn from Ethereum? Ethereum has really made a huge contribution through rollups showing that you can use um, a type of cryptography, zero knowledge proofs. And there are other methods as well. But this is the most important one to allow Ethereum and the things that are happening on Ethereum to interact trustlessly with the other protocols, with the side chains or the rollups that are built on Ethereum. So ordinals, the reason it works is because it actually doesn't use the Bitcoin asset, right? Um, we, we can build and we will be building. I expect over the next year we're going to see a huge number of, of different types of standards and tokens coming to Bitcoin. But can they trustlessly interact with Bitcoin and can Bitcoin be used in all kinds of new DeFi systems? And there's a growing body of people who want to take the learnings of um, you know, Ethereum and introduce basically just one ability, the ability to trustlessly move Bitcoin from one uh, from Bitcoin main chain onto other chains, because until you have that, you don't have truly permissionless ability to build with Bitcoin and to build on Bitcoin. And so why is this debate important? It's important because a lot of people aren't even aware that this is a technological possibility now. And um, as the people who are most unaware of it are the people who are most unaware of Ethereum. So that frequently that's Bitcoiners themselves. But I think the Bitcoin community, the Bitcoin technical community is waking up to the opportunity. And um, it's very likely that we're going to see more and more voices and more and more technology um, built, which is proposing a way to provide Bitcoin with this kind of escape velocity. And once you have that, then you can truly build anything you want on Bitcoin. And really this conversation becomes sort of just, you know, masturbatory philosophizing because the developers will do whatever the developers do. Brad, I want to get, before going to Udi and Travis, uh, I want to get your general thoughts. I've never asked you that question uh, in previous spaces, your position on ordinals. Um, I think, I think like obviously it's no surprise. I think the ordinal side of it is like more of a pump and dump technology. It's not Bitcoin. It's it's just like a lens that you can look at uh, sats <laughs> through. Inscriptions is the more interesting side of the technology. The what you know what you're talking about with being able to do rollups with inscriptions. As far as I know, ordinals is not needed. For that, it's just the inscription side of things. You can like inscribing things onto the Bitcoin blockchain, whether you think that's a waste of space or whatever. It doesn't matter. It's it's technically possible and it's done in a it's done in a Bitcoin way. It's just that second part of it which everybody gets excited about because you know that's the crypto culture of launching tokens and you know figuring out ways to. To make money and, and all of that that that's what the the ordinals piece gives but the inscriptions is actually the technology the ordinals is just like a pump and dump lens to put on top of inscriptions 
Udi? I think when people uh, talk about ordinals, usually they just mean both. They just mean ordinals and inscriptions. They use it as an umbrella term. Uh, it's true that there is a technical like distinction between them, but you know they were both invented by the same person and they're both part of the same uh, protocol specification. So I think when people say ordinals, they also mean inscriptions in, in general. And and yeah, it, to me personally, the the reason I'm excited about ordinals is not you know specifically the ability to create tokens. It's just because it showed that there's so many people who are you know traditionally not Bitcoin only people, um, definitely not laser eyes, and 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 suddenly they became really interested in Bitcoin. And they seem to, you know, like you could you could say stuff like, oh, uh, they only do it because they want to pump and dump or whatever. You can say that. But the end result is uh, once the pump and dump is over, they end up with Bitcoin in their wallet. They end up with a Bitcoin wallet, which they didn't have before. And they have BTC in it. And they're now thinking about ways well, to unless, own more BTC. Uh, they'll, have, they'll have BTC unless they've been dumped on. Then they won't have BTC and they'll probably leave with a bad taste in their mouth. Sure. Aren't we, like Brad's point of like bringing the ugly side to Bitcoin's relatively clean ecosystem, the ugly side of crypto. Like pump and dumps were meant to have ended in 2017, 2018. And then 2020, 2021 was even worse. Yeah. No, that's a great, that's I mean, that's a, that's a great point. I think, I think that if you look at, you know, Here's the thing. Here's what happened I, the, between the last bull market, the previous one in 2017, 18, and the one we had now. Um, in the past, you used to, if you wanted to interact with the ICO bubble, which was like, what, 99.9999% scam. I, it, you could say 100% is fine. <laughs> it was like almost completely a scam. Uh, but people interacted with it and... And in order to enter the crypto ecosystem back then, they kind of had to get Bitcoin. It was very difficult to on-ramp directly to Ethereum. So a lot of people bought Bitcoin first, got a Bitcoin wallet, played around with that a bit, moved some of it to ETH, played around with ICOs, got burned probably. And, and, but then they became Bitcoiners. Now you fast forward to 21, 22, most people who got into crypto did that either for DeFi or NFTs. And you could say, yeah, you could say they lost money, whatever. But at the end of the day, they have MetaMask installed and they have some amount of ETH in it. You could argue they could have had much more if they didn't play the NFT and uh, DeFi games. That's for many of them is probably true. But at least they have a wallet, the, they have ETH, the, the, and they have the, a passion the, now. The ninety, the ninety percent of ninety five, whatever percent of people that lost money in crypto in the last bull market, I can't remember where I saw that statistic. All of that is true. They're so, not coming back. Yeah, they're not yeah, coming back. But, right. that's, but that's what I'm. They that's are what absolutely mean. coming but, back. But, but there's the five percent. No, that, but there's the five percent who's. But there's the five percent who stays. Definitely, they're they are definitely coming my, back. My, they're definitely coming back. They're absolutely yeah, coming you back. you know, look, you could argue, you could argue about whether or not they're coming back. But I think the most interesting part is that whether whether we have 5% that stays or whether we have 90% that will come back in the future or whatever it is, the point is they have a MetaMask wallet and they have ETH in it and they do not have a Bitcoin wallet and they do not have they do not share any of the Bitcoin culture values. And that's in stark contrast to what happened in 2018. Back then, people who got burnt at least had some Bitcoin. And, and yeah, maybe they left, maybe Udi, they got burnt what, what too percentage, much. We what don't percentage have that of what percentage of the millions of people that installed MetaMask in the last cycle to buy dog to tokens do you think share Ethereum cultural values? I would say five five percent, and, and I'm, you know I don't have the numbers, but I would say it's something. And those are and do you think the do problem you think is all the people that installed AOL CDs shared AOL cultural values? Well, I will I will tell. I, I don't understand I don't understand what what's unclear here. It's they definitely don't share Bitcoin values, you know? And and yeah, I just think the, it's the a, ones it's who just choose a to stay, it's a neutral it's a neutral phenomenon. You have a little It's not you neutral. Point, it's not neutral. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. The ones not who network choose to effects stay, that are like insurmountable I'll that tell are you why. stay there forever. I'll tell you why. The one who choose to stay are now learning about how they can build on Ethereum, how they can make Ethereum better. How they can build products and, and businesses there. They're not learning about Bitcoin because they never interacted with it. They don't have anything against it. They just didn't have the chance to interact with it because you know they didn't have a reason to. Now, fast forward to Ornolds. Of course, it's it's smaller. Or the Ornolds community is smaller still. But the people who are interacting with it now are thinking about, hey, let's find out how we can build on Bitcoin because that's that's what we know. That's what we've been part of. That's the wallet I have. That's the tech I understand. 
that's what for some of them it, it gave them some wealth for some of them it didn't but it gave them you know a community and they, they're interested in it the, it's not that they have something against ethereum they just weren't exposed to it Udi, you yeah, I think I think you're point. referring to a really good point. One second, Simon. A really, really good point. For those who came in in previous cycles, obviously 2013 earlier, but then also even 2016, 17, like myself, even I, I admittedly, I came in as a trader trying to make dollars, but the only trading pairs were in Bitcoin, right? Exactly to your point. So everybody who came in to crypto in 2016 or 2017, basically, if they wanted to participate in any way, shape, or form, had to own Bitcoin. There was no such thing, really, for most altcoins as USD trading pairs, and certainly stable coins were uh, effectively irrelevant, barely, barely existed, and still under development. So, Udi's right here. I, I really hadn't thought about this so deeply, but every single person I know who came in in that cycle, even if they just wanted to interact with shit coins or trade or try to make dollars they literally had to own bitcoin to do it and we're trading in a bitcoin pair which gave you an understanding of the value of bitcoin versus dollars sats all those things